Hello and welcome to today's lesson which begins the Persian Wars and the Battle of Marathon fighting in a very small space. The Battle of Marathon was a surprise victory for the Greeks. They were not anticipating really being able to defeat the Persians. The Persians were the world empire and the world, world's greatest power at that time. And for the Persians, the Greeks really were like you know, a bunch of flies. You know, you shouldn't really have to worry about these pesky little Greeks. They should be a pushover and a knockover. And indeed, before this battle, the Persians had already gone to a number of islands in the Aegean and very close to Asia Minor and had defeated the people who had resisted their landings and a couple of the islands, at least one of them, Naxos, just surrendered as soon as the Persian fleet came into the harbor. And so the Persians also were very uh, confident, very heady. They believed that when they landed at Marathon, which was the closest, most accessible beach for landing triremes, they believed it would be a very short and simple process of landing, showing up at Athens and accepting surrender. Now, it was a surprise victory and a big victory for the, uh, the Greeks, but it was a small one. And all of the Greek victories were relatively small. Again, we're talking about Persia, an empire that is able to send millions of men into battle. Just a constant stream, an unending stream of men into the fight. It would have been 10, 15 years of constant fighting before Persia began to even think of having a strain or a drain on the manpower. And so to be turned back at this battle and to then be turned back about 10 years later, and we'll study about this later, really was a significant victory for the Greeks, totally outside of what should have been. And you really, I really want you to bake that idea into your consciousness, uh, just that this very small contingent, this very small group of very determined people were able to defeat a very large empire. Timeline leading up to Marathon, of course, we know about in 499, the Ionian Revolt, and how by 497, the Ionian Revolt had um, successfully captured the capital of Sardis. And then after that, the war started to go badly. And so by 492, the Ionian Revolt was crushed by the then satrap of Sardis. Then in 492 and until 490, Darius brooded over the revolt and swore vengeance on Athens. Uh, while Athens was not the only city-state to resist him and to have contributed to the Ionian revolt, it was the one that really stood out in Darius's mind. And so he was reminded every day by a servant and every meal Sire, remember the Athenians. And so after about a year and a half of shipbuilding, uh, he was able to launch 600 triremes and sent them sweeping, as I said, through the Aegean and then into Marathon in 490. Now they arrive on the shore of Marathon and we'll see a map of Marathon here in a few moments. So I really want you to you know, know that you'll be paying, seeing that. But uh, so the generals assembled on the shore 
but there was a disunity between them. They weren't sure what they should do. Should they attack? Should they go forward or just wait? There was no there was no consensus. There were ten generals and five had the opinion of immediately attacking and five had the opinion of waiting. Now Miltidates was one of the generals in favor of attacking, but in order to keep the leadership democratic as befitted Athens and the cities, they would have a different leader, a different general each day. And so for the first five days, obviously, and it kind of ended up that the first five generals were, who were in charge were in favor of not attacking. And so every day the Persians would get ready, would stand up and uh, show themselves. The Greeks would also get ready in battle formation, but they'd just kind of stand there and have a stare off, and then they would go back to their camps later on in the afternoon. So nobody is really doing anything at this point. And Miltiades is just, he's waiting. He's uh, hoping that kind of the Persians won't go away and that he will be able to have the chance to confront them. Now he's got a couple of days left. Uh, on the sixth day, the sixth general still declines to attack. He loses his nerve and just decides, hmm, not gonna do this. On the seventh day, Miltiades had his command and as soon as there was any glint of sunlight, an appearance that they could attack, he started getting ready. So they attacked the Persians and fought hard, and this would turn into a very sweaty, blood-filled uh, push and shoving match. You know, it's a warm day. It's probably going to be somewhere around uh, 30, maybe 26 uh, Celsius, uh, I would say Fahrenheit, about 80 degrees. So warm day, probably fairly humid because this is taking place right on the beach. Not the best of places. Uh, so here is a map of Marathon. And you can see several different things. Number one, at the top right, you will see some blue shading and that is a marsh area. And it's got a companion marsh down to the very lower left middle. And you also note the mountains and how they really make this a very hard space in which to fight. There is a valley, narrow valley leading into Marathon, well, to the beach there. That is, if you go up that narrow space between the two mountains, that would be the city state of Marathon. The red line is the Persians, the blue line is the Greeks. Now, the Greeks could not deploy, neither could the Persians deploy any cavalry. And one of the reasons is the stream here, the river, was a natural obstacle to them being able to fight. So the Greeks advanced together in a phalanx, and a phalanx is a wall of men with their shields slightly overlapping one over the other. So they're very close together. You know, you don't have any personal space. Imagine kind of like the lunch line at Schildick and, you know, just having no personal space. <laughs> so you're marching with your shield, your armor, your sword and spear. And basically what you're going to do and what they, these men were working towards was you're going to push, you're going to hit the other line, the Persian line, and you're just going to try to shove them back. And as you're shoving them, you've got your spear and you're spearing them. They've got their swords and they're trying to attack you. So now it becomes this uh, pushing, shoving match with a lot of sweating, swearing, and trying to kill you and stab you. 
Now, as I said, the Persians had around 600 triremes or ships, and the the number of the men was about 10,000. Now, I had another picture prepared for this, and it was a GIF slide, so it would have been a little bit easier to see, but the person succeeded in the middle part of the Greek phalanx, but and they were able to push them back, but on the wings, the Persians were pushed back and unable, actually not even able to advance, but like, you know, like I said, literally pushed back. And so it became this bow shaped type of confrontation that you see. Now, eventually the Persian said, you know what? I don't want to do any more of this. I need to stop fighting. And you can see those little red arrows pointing back towards the beach. And that's the Persians running away. Here are some examples of what the warriors would have looked like. We have the bronze, the heavy set bronze uh, chest plate. You'll see the Corinthian helmet on the man with the long spear and the sword. You notice this is not, you know, man briefs or man diapers and leather straps and all this other stuff. This is not 300. The 300 was completely wrong in its portrayal of Spartan or Greek panoply, as it's called. Uh, they would have very heavy armor. It would cover the entire chest and intestine area, upper and lower. Your head is completely covered, as you can see. Your nose is also protected. You know, these, and this was going to be something hot. You are not going to be very comfortable in this. Uh, you would be sweating, drenched from just your own exertion. But they were fully covered, and you can see how large the shield was. A very interesting incident, and I always want to bring in a uh, primary source and an actual account, word account here. So it says Epizelus, the son of Cophagoras, an Athenian, was in the thick of the fray. He was in the middle of the battle, just right there. And behaving himself as a brave man should, when suddenly he was stricken with blindness, without blow of sword or dart, and this blindness continued thenceforth during the whole of his life after this. Now, the following is the account which he himself, as I have heard, gave of the matter. He said that a gigantic warrior, so a big, big Persian man, uh, with a huge beard, which shaded all of his shield, so it covered all of his shield, stood over against him, but the ghostly semblance passed him by and slew the man at his side. Such, as I understand, was a tale which Epizelus told. So this is an amazing moment. This man is confronted by one of the biggest warriors he's ever seen in his entire life. His beard is so big that it's covering part of a shield and, you know he just must be massively built and he is standing right there in front of him and instead of killing him the man next to him gets killed and he survives yet it causes him so much fear and so much panic that i guess the blood pressure burst his uh his, his eyes the blood vessels and his eyes and the other parts of it to where he couldn't see after that. It's an incredible moment. So the successful repulse of the Persians gave Greece 10 years of peace and time to prepare for the next war. The Persians fled the battle. They fled uh, Marathon. They got back on their ships. The Greeks pursued them to the beach and continued to fight with them all the way until the majority of the triremes had left the beach. Uh, they were just wanting to kill every single person that they possibly could. 
So the successful repulse uh, gave them a chance to prepare for war. Uh, Benjamin Franklin said the best way to prepare for peace is to prepare for war. And so that is what the Greeks did as well. They prepared, they secured their peace by preparing for war. Now, since Marathon included soldiers from Athens, Plataea, Sparta, Thebes, Corinth, the victory was seen as a grand moment of Greek unity and ability to unite in the face of a common threat. Also, it influenced the decision of Athens to invest a silver mine strike to put all of the money into building the largest fleet of triremes that the Greeks had seen. Athens had as many triremes as all of the other Greek city-states combined. So, so in Athens, there was a silver mine and they found a new source of silver ore in the rocks. And what they did was they voted to use the silver to pay for new triremes and to build up a large trireme navy. And they built 200 triremes and manned them with this money. And they said, we're doing this because we know eventually we will have to face the Persians again, and it will most likely be at sea. Also began the Athenian rise to victory. And really the Athenian rise, I should have put it a little differently. Yes, it's the rise of Athens to victory. And it is also the, the beginning of Athens's rise to prominence within the Greek world. Uh, while the other contingents were there, Athens had contributed the largest number of soldiers to the battle. So they really tried to take and did successfully take the largest share of glory for the victory of the battle. Thank you.